Welcome to TTP, Turnbuckle Talk Podcast. You're listening to Keeman Cooper and John Dugan. This podcast is sponsored by Dirty Blondes. Dirty Blondes is a bar located in the heart of Blackpool, famous for their banging tunes, cocktails and 18-inch pizzas. The only place to get a pizza as big as your table across the Fowl Coast. If you're ever in Blackpool, check them out. They're on Facebook and on Instagram. That's Dirty Blondes. Blackpool. Let's talk wrestling. <clears throat> Welcome to TTP Turnbuckle Talk podcast. I'm joined by the Scottish stud, John Dugan. Hello. <laughs> Hello, how are you? I'm good. We've got a special guest today. We've got TV personnel and NXT UK uh, correspondent is Ratsy. Hello, mate. How are you, lads? Good, Hello. yeah. John, I've got to ask first of all, what part of Scotland are you from? Uh, so my family's from Greenock. Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm uh, from Dundee, so I know, I know Dundee, uh, Dundee very well. Glasgow, pretty well. Inverness in the north, actually not bad. It's my granny's from originally, but yeah, I love all things Highland. Uh, so Greenock's near Glasgow. It's like Glasgow, Paisley area. It's quite close. It, who do you support in football? I'm a Liverpool fan. So we've got Liverpool, Man City, but at least we're balancing <laughs> it with the greatest football team of all time, Arsenal Football Club. Oh, there you go. <laughs> well, in which respect, you know, a lot of my family are from Manchester, so, I mean... Oh, fair play. To be fair, yeah. that's not the um, the stereotype, though, is it? It's, I even work in Manchester a fair bit. It's the City fans are from Manchester, but United fans are supposedly from further afield. That's not my opinion, obviously. That's just what some people say. <laughs> well, my uncles used to say there's only two teams in Manchester... Manchester City and Man- Manchester City women. <laughs> um, so I just want to say thank you for coming on because um, John will know I'm a huge fan. And ever since we started this podcast, I said, we need to get this guy on. He's so good and he's done so much. Oh, thank I, you, mate. Honestly, you're yeah. very under- underrated, I think. Thank you. Yeah, well, I've been on TV for about... Uh... Well, I, I tried to get my break in TV. I started 2010, got my first break in 2013, and that was with CBC. Did that show called Wild for 10 weeks of live TV. And I, but ah, oh, John's just taking a sip out of his mug, and that is an amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I say F for a reason because it's the old school. Oh, with Austin. Mate, I'm just listening to <laughs> Steve-O from Jackass and Stone Cold Steve Austin interview. And that is nuts that you've just brought. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, and so then, then it took me 10 weeks of live TV of just frothing with nerves. And then I straight off the back of that got my job um, on Blue Peter. Worked there for five and a half years. And that was, I mean, I was hint when I got that job. In fact, talking about Manchester, I was living in Hatter's Hostel in Manchester at that point. So I was skint and then um, basically haven't stopped since then. So as soon as I got that job on Blue Peter, that kind of hustler's mentality that took me three years of working for free, I thought I'm just going to carry on. And so that's led me to doing everything from Songs of Praise to Strongman to Crufts to NXC UK. <laughs> Don't forget the mascot as well. Mascot spiked yeah. the line, mate. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were good times. If you ever want a, a weight loss program, put a mascot suit on for about 10 hours and you'll be absolutely shredded like Finn Balor. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you still got your Blue Peter badge? Do you display it out? Or... Because really. you guys are obviously fans of the greatest thing of all time, wrestling. Shall I go and get the badge? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Give me 30 seconds. Back in a sec, boys. So, this is like my is. personal own IC title. It is not just any badge, it is the BP Ooh. Gold badge. I was just saying to John, is it true the Queen has a badge, a Blue Peter badge? The Queen has a gold badge. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, there have been about a thousand gold badges that have been given out. Um, and they give them out to um, certain people. And then when I left the show, they kind of honoured me with a gold badge. So I, I grew up watching Blue Peter as a kid. So to get that was kind of wow. And in fact, when I went to, we were in WrestleMania. This is, right, because of, because of last year, my, my years are now slightly warped. It was, yes, it was 2017 Mania in Orlando. And, um, and so 
we basically get to go to the performance center, which was relatively new then. And um, we go there and we find out there's going to be a talk given to all the media there. And it's going to be by a guy called Paul Levesque. Now, in my production, I've gone, guys, that's Triple H. Like, no, no, it just says Paul Levesque. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 that's Triple H. They weren't nearly as excited as I was, bar my mate, Jack, who loves it as much as I do. And, um, and so we're in the performance center. And I thought, I wonder how he's going to enter the ring. Because it was in the, in the ring that he was going to do this speech. Everyone's gathered around the ring. And I thought, I don't suppose we're going to hear Motorhead. And then somebody on the microphone says, uh, ladies and gentlemen from the media, we're now going to be hearing a, uh, a talk by the CEO of WWE, Triple H. Duh, time to play the game. <laughs> Full stereo around the place. And I thought, I have made it. And then hearing <laughs> each of here, we gave him a Blue Peter badge. We gave, who do we else we give a, a badge to? Um, to William Regal, to a number of people. And it's just really cool because all the Brits totally get it. And they go, <laughs> oh my goodness, it's a Blue Peter badge. I always wanted one of these. <laughs> very, very cool thing. Well, um, cool. shout out to John's missus. Um, she did hairspray um, and she actually has a Blue Peter badge nice what was it for yeah. she, as a kid or uh, as an adult so she performed on blue peter with uh when she was in hairspray so she's got the badge as well what year was that uh i think it was 2013 oh i started in 2013 so i started mid-october 2013 so maybe I uh, so it was uh she said it was barney that was on it okay because I said, though, you may have met him already, and she said, no, it was Barney that was presented at the time. Yeah, yeah. maybe Helen Skelton. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think it was, yeah. Very cool. But yeah, I was well excited when I found out, because we just, like, recently moved, and he was in a box, and I was like, <laughs> why is this not being out the whole time? But, yeah, it's one of them cool about, things, uh, isn't it? That's the thing about Blue Peter. Like you said, Brits get it. And when I think of Blue Peter, I think of um, Connie... Um, oh yeah like she was blue peter when i grew up like i loved her she was great and you know when you say you loved her do you mean <laughs> her? a little bit like kimberly from the power rangers where you you liked her but you liked her a little bit more than just liked her i don't know maybe there was something about her she was just so such full of energy and you didn't really see that energy that much on kids tv shows that you did on blue peter and especially yeah. with all the challenges that, you know, Blue Peter does. Yeah, mate, it's, you know what? So my favourite all-time presenter was a guy called Simon Thomas. And even meeting him uh, as an adult, actually, I met him at Wimbledon the first time I was working there. And I saw him uh, with his wife, who's unfortunately passed away now. But I thought, am I going to go and interrupt his time viewing Wimbledon to basically say, Simon, you are my all-time favourite Blue Peter presenter. I thought, am I going to tell him? <laughs> And I thought, uh, yes, I am. So <laughs> I went over to him. I said, I said, oh, hi, Simon. I said, I'll just be really quick. I don't want any of your time. Uh, just wanted to say. And then he said, oh, hi, Radzi. I thought, this is mental. This is absolute. Now, for anyone who hasn't seen Blue Peter before, obviously me saying this is a little bit weird. But it's, <laughs> I guess it's a little bit like, I mean, as, as did happen, you know, when, when you speak to, let's say, Shawn Michaels or all of that, as I mentioned, these guys, as well as being unbelievable talents in the ring, on the mic, actually, they're blokes as well. And so when you speak to them, you'll speak to them as, as normal guys, even if the very first time you speak to them, you go, it's the game, Triple H, that's speaking to me right now. And then your 10-year-old goes, okay, we've had our moment, it's now time to be serious again. But yeah, speaking to Simon Thomas was just, you know, what a man. And I think there's something special about... A connection to your childhood so i think as an adult if so i love hip-hop and if there's somebody that i like now in music let's say me to them will be cool or a film star tv star whoever it might be author astronaut that'll be cool but when it's somebody you grew up watching there's just something about that that's how are you even here this is you are not real and they everything they touch turns to gold type thing so simon thomas that was kind of my, my version of that. And he was just such a such a wonderfully humble man and just a really, really great bloke. 
you uh, managed to do the exact skydive as him as well, I believe. Mate, nailed on. Yeah, and it was actually because of him that I did it. And actually, mm. so I got my... So I mentioned it took me three years to get my break in TV. Um, so I did everything from... Uh, there was a competition on KISS FM called the KISS Chosen One, where 25,000 people entered to win a contract to work on the station. And I applied, and you went from 25,000 to the top 25. And I made the top 25, which was an academy. And then I didn't go any further. Entered again the following year, same number of people entered. Made the top 25, then the top 10, then the top five. And then I basically came second. And that was pretty much the story of my journey into presenting, was close but no cigar. And on Blue Peter, I applied for Blue Peter in 2011, got down to the final three, because uh, a guy called Andy had left, and then they didn't replace Andy. So they decided off the back of the three of us who'd, who'd made that final cut, they thought, we don't, we don't need anyone. We, we'd rather stick with just two. So that was my first time doing it. Then there was another competition that was called Blue Peter, You Decide. I won't bore you with the reasons why, but because I was a runner interning at CBBC, that precluded me from being able to apply, even though I had applied and then got the, nod, got the word back to say I couldn't do it. In a brief nutshell, the contract that you signed when you entered said you couldn't have worked up on the, for the BBC up to a certain date. Unfortunately, I was asked to extend my three-month internship by two weeks, which I agreed to. That extension put me past the cutoff date by one day. Oh, no. And I was absolutely mortified. And so, and it's one of the very few times I've cried to my mum since being an adult. And I, and I came back and my mum said, so I was in, a, in this hostel. I went back to Wolverhampton at the weekends, where, which is where I'm from. And my mum said, uh, are you okay, Radzi? And I, and I actually, I, I was about to say I'm not too good. And as I said it, I, I just broke down in tears. And it was three years of working for free, three years of close but no cigar, three years of lots of people saying, you've clearly got what it takes. It's going to happen. But three years of just being absolutely skint and demoralized and questioning if it would ever happen. And there's no guarantee that it would happen. Um, and I just said, I just don't know how much more I can take of this. And my mum said to me, Radzi, you told me Simon Thomas got it on his third time of asking you've only had two. That means you've still got one more to go. And it was likely to kick up the arse in a, in a really loving way. And actually she didn't want me to keep trying. That was the truth of it. And she wanted me to go into teaching because it was a, it was a guaranteed profession. She thought I'd be good at it. And we had that conversation a year before. But when she said that, I remember thinking, yes, you're right. And so it's because of Simon Thomas that I carried on and then when I then got my job on Blue Peter, it was then because of Simon Thomas, I wanted to have a moment that Blue Peter fans would remember. And I wanted it to be a moment. And for me, the thing, I, one of my sort of really visceral, vivid memories of Simon was him jumping out of the plane and you as a viewer just going, what is going on? It was just, it was a suspense of time. It was so beautifully done. And it was with the same team, so the RF Falcons, at the same location, Lake Elsinore, doing the same thing as Simon Thomas. And, um, and actually, so Simon Thomas, unfortunately, had a malfunction midair. And I won't say he nearly died, but that's actually what he said on camera. Um, having worked with the RAF, they've informed me that he didn't nearly die at all. It was just the emotion at the time. But as a result of that, he, he basically, for want of a better word, bottled it. And he, he couldn't then get the courage to jump out of the plane again. And I understand why, because I've tried to do it myself. And it will, I mean, flipping out, all I'd say is don't have a big breakfast, mm -hmm. come out of both ends. But God. the reason <laughs> I managed to do it was knowing that it was plausible that I could bottle it. So the, the entire time I was there, all I was, the actual mantra I was hearing in my head all the time was don't bottle it, don't bottle it, don't bottle it. And because I was facing that demon, if you like, all the time, then it meant that, it didn't come as a shock to me. I was just waiting for this fear to kick in. And then it was going to be me versus the fear and you're going to jump out of a plane. And so that was a very long rambling story to basically say, yes, I did it because of Simon Thomas. And <laughs> he's an absolute legend. 
there's a lot of challenges I've seen you do um, where <laughs> you're not in the profession to do it. No disrespect, but like they kind of throw you in the deep end. Sometimes, you know, like quite literally with um, jumping off a 10 foot, you know, diving board mm -hmm. and then you swam um, Windermere Lake. That's right, yeah. Like, how do you prepare for that? Because, like I said, you're not a swimmer, you know, by profession. How does your mind kind of work around that? So I'll tell you a little story that I wouldn't normally tell um, about the diving. So basically, I am off the back of, that was filmed, I think, from memory, the diving. So it was in Plymouth, the same coach as Tony, Tony, Tom Daly used to have, um, called Andy, great bloke. And um, we went down to where, like I said, he used to train and where the GB setup was. And um, I had worked th for three months on the second series of this show called Wild. And so I was doing Wild Thursday, Friday, no, sorry, Friday, Saturday, and then travel back on the Saturday, just be shattered on the Sunday, and then work on Blue Peter, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So I was doing at least six day weeks for 10 weeks. And it meant I hadn't been to the gym for those 10 weeks. And I, and I was also service station lifestyle. So I was in woeful Nick. And I didn't get the nod to say, I'd rather you're not gonna be doing um, a diving film. I went, scuba diving, amazing. I've been so looking forward to going scuba diving. I've said we should do this. They went, no, no, it's, 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 it's diving, it's in high diving. I went, all right, when are they doing that? Thinking to myself, if they give me five weeks, I can be in all right, Nick. If they give me three weeks, I'm gonna be mm, struggling a bit. Two weeks, I can at least make myself presentable. They went, it's um, uh, on Sunday and it's now Thursday. Oh no, oh no, I'm gonna be in trunks on national television in absolutely <laughs> Oh no, uh, and then off the back of that, cause I've got really supportive friends. One of my mates texted me and has just gone after the, sh after the film's gone out. I didn't realize you'd stopped training. Oh, that was a wound, that was an absolute wound. Um, and then the other end of that spectrum is for Lake Windermere. So we did that, uh, that was 2015, I think, March. And that's basically the coldest month of the year, pretty much. So you have, I think it's January, February, March are the, are the three coldest. And so out of a tap, cold water is about 10 degrees. That water was five degrees. And the original plan was that I would do wow. it in trunks. And basically, the ins <laughs> unbeknownst to me, so we've gone to a canal in Salford, the, the glorious Salford Canal. It's like Venice, but just less glamorous. And I do a lot colder. <laughs> and, um, and they've gone... So I don't know this. What I think that we're doing is a film about me swimming in the Salford Canal to experience how cold it is. And so I'm wearing trunks. I've gotten in the water and I've lasted maybe... Well, okay, I've swam less than 10 metres and that was me at my absolute limit. It's not, I, I actually couldn't take any more. I was just gone. And it took me an hour to recover. So I, an hour of shivering afterwards. And what I didn't know was it was meant to be a part two of that film straight away afterwards, which was, so Radzi, that was pretty cold. Well, fortunately for you, you've actually got a wetsuit. So because your challenge won't be done in skins, it will be done with a wetsuit. So they had to abandon it because I responded that badly to the cold. So <laughs> the health and safety reasons they've got, it's just not gonna work. So they've then gone to this instructor, an amazing guy called Colin Hill, um, and he, said right it's just this thing might not work because rads he basically isn't fat enough but we're actually going to need him to put on fat so they then gave me mass gainer so i basically took every day two drinks of mass gainer so it's about a thousand calories in a in a big pint glass times two a day to try and get me to put on weight because <laughs> otherwise i would not be able to cross wind it's just it's just not going to happen just not going to happen um, and so I've got two, two extremes. One, I'm too lean. One, I'm too fat. But there you go. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, so well, was it always like that? Did they just say, right, you're going to be doing this in a couple of days? Did you ever have a sort of save if you wanted to do it or not do it? Did you have that choice or was it just like you're doing this? We called it being volunteered. So... <laughs> <laughs> So that swim was meant to be three of us in a relay race or in a relay, if you like, to complete it. And my colleague Lindsay went, no way. 
my colleague Barney went, no way. And I was brand new at this point. And I didn't know they'd said no way. In fact, it must've been 2014 actually. It was 2014 because I just started. I started in the October of 2013. So it was, right. So I started in the October, mid-October 2013. And I'm in the water at the very start of December, same year. So six weeks in, I don't know. They've turned it down. So I've just gone, I mean, yeah, let's, let's do this thing. That I'm clearly going to be awful at. But also I just think life, in life, how many times do you get the opportunity to find out if you've got what it takes? And, you know, Kieran, you mentioned obviously not that not being my profession. That was kind of the beauty of it is that no one's expecting you to be Kerry Ann Payne, a potential Olympic medalist in open water swimming from 2012. They're just, they can relate to you. And eventually what you become better at is communicating that story and communicating that fear. And as a, as blokes, we sort of go, you know, no, you know, I'm not going to show any fear and I'm not going to show any vulnerability, but actually what kids relate to is honesty. And so if you're about to get in ridiculously cold water, turning to the camera just before you jump in and go, I wish I was where you are right now. <laughs> Three, two, one, and you go. Everyone's with you rather than being kind of just watching this bloke do something. And so that was what I loved about it. And when you sign up to it, you know, you know, you're going to be asked to do crazy things. And I mean, what an absolute privilege it is, you know, whether it is, I mean, training with the world's best, with the Falcons. What am I doing with the RAF Falcons? I'm just a bloke, just a talentless bloke lobbing himself out of a plane. But we've got the world's finest skydivers saying, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. And this is, and you know, the training, the preparation. Yeah, just a real honour. What was your um, favourite challenge that you did? Was it one of them or was it some, something else? So in terms of adrenaline, it was definitely the Falcons. Um, in terms of kind of something that meant something to me personally. Um, so Martin Luther King uh, in 1965 walked from Sel or March from Selma to Montgomery as basically a protest. And it was a 50 odd mile walk. And um, I got to do that exact walk uh, on Blue Peter and met some of the people who were on that march along the way. And it was just the, the biggest privilege. It was just... Um, to kind of literally walk in the footsteps of history. It was a real honour. And um, this is kind of, I suppose, a little bit before Black Lives Matter. This is just very much a, a standalone film that I said to Blue Peter, I said, look, you know, this is something that I'd really like to do. Martin Luther King, somebody that, you know, as a kid, I, I just used to think is one of humanity's finest humans. And, um, and then they actually came up with the concept of I could, I could do that walk. And it was just incredible and that that was again the beauty of blue peter you did the anything from the the most adrenalized experiences on planet earth to i guess the poignant and touching it's a good mixture isn't it blue peter i think yeah like you said it's um did you ever do any of the this is something i made earlier so they hate <laughs> saying that did they? Yes, because it's because it's such an old school line. They <laughs> basically they felt about that the same way, I suppose, as newsreaders don't shuffle papers anymore, because it's, mm. it's so tried. So, but I I used to crowbar lines in. So one I used to say was things like, um, if I was talking about my hair, here's one I made curlier. Was one I said, um, <laughs> and, and, um, and and guests that came on. I'd hear them go to me, oh, it's such a shame that we're not allowed to say, here's one I made earlier. And I said, well, I can't because I've been here for a little while. I went, but you can, we're live, mate. I said, so I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll tee you up. And so I <laughs> just say things alike. Um, and well, I, I guess that's as far as the stages go. And he, well, no, Razzy, because here's <laughs> one we made earlier. And then you get a few guys in the crew go, hooray! Because <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you just have to do it at least once. But uh, yeah, short answer is they didn't like you doing it. Uh, that's interesting. I just want to um, move on to gladiators. Yeah, yet again, with gladiators and Brits, you know what I mean? It goes hand in hand. We loved yeah. it as a kid. Um, so to be on gladiators... That must have been amazing. Well, do you remember? Uh, well, I'm not sure if you ever saw the one on Sky One because the one on ITV was 
the one in the 90s mm. that was just flipping mm. epic forget about all the nonsense on singing and dancing and all the rest of it we're talking proper television but in the sky one version there was oblivion and oblivion is now a wrestler so he really? yeah and, and annoyingly i was hoping you might know his name because as soon as i said it, i thought radzi you can't think of his name <laughs> um, it, it will come to me and um and yeah so getting to do that and as an arsenal fan being working with ian wright flipping mm, ian wright yeah i mean he was my <laughs> password at school and so ian wright, just a <laughs> hero of a geezer and he comes up to us so to all of us and um he goes gents and he comes running over <laughs> and says dan my name's ian good to meet you sir anyway rads my name's ian and i actually says i tried to play it cool i actually went i know your name what's gone it's absolutely gone it's right here, like. right here. and that was that was so that was i mean gladiators so mm. good and um a little bit of history don't like to boast about it but i'm the first person ever to go backwards head first down the travelator it's not a big deal guys not a big deal um <laughs> quite impressive Wear a, wearing a swimming cap as well uh because i fully messed it up uh basically tore my adductor in the process so imagine Tom, i'm running 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 i get my foot at the very top where there's carpet in my head i told my bottom leg to lift up unfortunately there was clearly a delay between my between my trailing leg that should have pushed off the travel later and my brain because then what happened was i thought about it for a second I basically then did the splits on the travelator, spun around on it, and then came back down head first. It was all very embarrassing. But that was <laughs> that was so, so, so good. Yeah. You was, have another record as well for Gladiators. I don't know if you know this, but you were the lightest contestant. <laughs> so, okay, if that was okay, I'm gonna if that, I'm gonna tell you a bit of a secret then. So uh, if I <laughs> if I was the lightest, it's because I lied about my body weight. So that, that's because I thought there's no way they're going to choose me. Because at that point, what do you remember what weight it was? It said that I, I was out of interest. Um, I want to say 10 stone. Ah, okay. It's true then. I was 10 stone. <laughs> <laughs> right, because when we applied for it, I had basically written down that I was lighter than I was. And, the, oh, we must have got weighed. That's what happened then. We got weighed afterwards. Because I'd written down a light... So I, in terms of kilos, I think I put down that I was something like 58 kilograms. And the reason being is at the time, I think I was 60. Maybe I was 60. I didn't lie by much. But I thought, they're not going to want me because I'm not big enough. But I know if I'm going to get chosen, they're probably going to want to choose the smallest bloke. So don't be... <laughs> one of the smallest be the smallest and then i actually got away but yeah i was i was 10 stones i was yeah, yeah, yeah look at how they're 10 stones but um yeah it was so it was i would encourage if that show comes back which it needs to get on it lads because it's great yeah i mean i re-watched the sky one uh reboot when it came out and then i re-watched it i really watched a few episodes because i obviously knew it was coming on and you are quite um Nick what? Aldis, by the way. Nick Aldis is, is, the guy, is the guy's name. Okay. I don't think I know him. So he is in. I only know this because I'm um, on my phone. So he, TNA. Is he with TNA? Okay. Um, I might have to look into that. Um, but yeah, so he was very light and it was quite ferocious, some of the gladiators. I mean, you took quite a beating. Mate, so in... um. In the gauntlet, I think you're probably referring to there. I so go unbeknownst to me at this point, I actually had uh, an ACL tear. I didn't know at this point, but I, I was carrying an ACL injury. And so the rules state in the gauntlet, so the gauntlet, for anyone who hasn't seen it before, you're running through a tunnel. So imagine mm -hmm. a, a, a circular tunnel, but without the roof. So it's 180 degree semicircle that you're running through. Five gladiators um, spaced about five meters apart with implements that they're going to hold to try and stop you running through them. And basically, so I'd gone past the first one. I'd gone past the second one. I thought I'd gone past the third one. And then he was on top of me. 
But what it was is it totally floored me, but my knee went. And my knee, um, it just had this, my knee had gone, but the reason it had gone is where my foot was on the actual gauntlet implement, I thought I was about to push off it to clear this guy to go to the next gladiator. But imagine a scenario where as you push off somebody, that person is then on you. It makes no sense. I didn't realize, but the fourth gladiator had kind of encroached into that zone and it was him that was on top of me. And as a result, my body wasn't in a very good position to take that impact. My knee went and um, anyway, he got disqualified. I kind of got, I think an extra point or whatever. And I think that was the uh, quarterfinals. That was the quarterfinals because in fact, no, it was brutal mate because the guy I was up against broke his arm on the same event. And then oh, no he go out and I then got, he then got replaced on Pyramid. Yes, because he got a red card, I believe. Exactly. Yeah. So my mate, uh, so a guy called Ian Deeth is the person who replaces him because he was the fastest loser from the heats. He goes through to then straight into the eliminator. And I remember the thing that gutted, he's now a really good friend of mine, but the thing that gutted me at the time was the fatigue of the day really batters you. So by the time you do the eliminator, I mean, the eliminator four, the quarterfinals was done at 1.30 in the morning. It was absolutely mental. And so I got back from back to the hotel that day, having won the eliminator at 2.30 in the morning. I was back in the studio to compete in the semifinals at eight in the morning. I was just wow. shot to bits, totally shot to bits. Uh, but that to one side, it was just so much fun. Injuries, whatever, who cares? <laughs> I'd take a torn ACL for that because it was awesome. Did they give you any sort of run through of what you've got to do in each thing before you do it? Or are you just put there and you've got to sort of work it out? Yeah, you're given a right. So you do. So what it was really was because it was a brand new show, the gladiators didn't know what they were doing as well as anybody else and things like timings. So if you imagine you've got a wall, let's just say that we have here in Chase's John starts. We don't know how much of a head start John's going to need in order to get far enough up the wall that it's going to actually make for some entertainment. Mm. So what we didn't realize at the time was they were timing our practices and they would use that to determine how far ahead the gladiators can give us. Furthermore, they were actually telling us the wrong information. So what they would say is, so, so guys, you need to go this way, then this way. We didn't know it was the slow way. So then the gladiators <laughs> then come the fast way and then grab you and ping you off the bloody wall. And it wasn't until one lad just basically went the shortcut and everyone went, oh, we could do that. And then you could actually see the production crew have just gone, oh no, they figured it out. Um, but so they were trying to work out so many things, how many seconds to award for things. Uh, like I say, how much of a head start people should have, what the rules should be. And, um, and yeah, so there was so much of that going on. So we did, I think, maybe, I'm going to say three days training at, on the location of the studio. Um, not specific to the actual event apparatus, but lots of different training. And at the time I was at uni, and so we were given money for food. I thought, <laughs> money for food? What? Hang on a second. We we're giving 40 quid a day for food. I could not believe it. I went to Wagamama's for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> They're giving me money to go to Wagamama's. I need to come back here and train again, lads. It was so good. And um, and I, you know, I was a student, and even <laughs> they had these protein bars. And at the time, I remember everybody took one protein bar and then this is in the actual the trials to get on the show. So there were 200 people that had all tried. And because I was so light, lied about my weight, I was at the very back. And so once I'd established that everyone had gone through having some people having taken one protein bar, there were about 60 protein bars left. I filled my bag with them. I mean, <laughs> one of the people said, is this for the, is this for the guys who are competing? Yeah, yeah. So can we come back to this room when we leave? No, no, you've got to take your bags. That's why you have to take your bags because no one's coming back to the room. So no one's coming back? No. 
I said, so if I'm going to take two oranges, could I take two oranges? She went, fill your boots. I went, I thought, <laughs> you mean I could take as many apples? <laughs> went, yeah, perfect. 60 protein bars, straight <laughs> in the bag. Because when you're a student, it's tough times. It's flipping tough times. <laughs> Great experience. Just before we kind of make a shift into wrestling, mm -hmm. um, I want to speak about your appearance on Pointless. Oh, yeah. Which one? Um, was your one? Oh, well, I'm referring to the one where you're with the great Bobby Baum. Ah, oh, what a bloke. What a bloke indeed. Yeah. So that one, that one. So I, I've been on it twice. One was with my friend Helen Skelton. One was with my friend Lindsay Russell. Oh. Both. One's a former Blue Peter presenter. One's a current Blue Peter presenter. Okay. The one with... So we actually won when I was with Lindsay. You the did. One, well, I say, you say we, but... She won. <laughs> she, 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 I provided nothing but the strength. <laughs> I, I think I basically got all the questions wrong and she just smashed it. And then the specialist subject was, so I'm still quite curious here what they would have asked. So we had two options, one or three options, but one that I could have chosen is, it was, um, uh, what was it? The London Marathon. So I thought, okay, the London Marathon, I've worked on the London Marathon. Now, the big problem is going to be, so if they say, it's going to be one of two questions, celebrity finishers of the marathon, in which case, Radzi is well in, because I've interviewed so many celebs that you wouldn't know their name. They're not household names inside their own households, so they're going to be pointless answers. <laughs> Option two, name a pointless winner. And then I thought, oh, of, of the actual race. And the problem is then it's going to look bad if I'm meant to be an athletics expert and I can't get it. Now, I could have <laughs> gone someone like Harley Gabri Selassie. I could have gone maybe Bernard Legat. I don't know. Um, Chapter Guy. Who knows? But because it was one was about Elton John, Lindsay, my colleague, has then gone, Elton John. I love Elton John. I literally love <laughs> Elton John. And because she, her eyes were light to I said, well, Lindsay, we've got to choose Elton John then. So we went to Elton John. And then hilariously, the question was about the Rocket Man film that she'd seen two days prior. And it was, oh, my goodness. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> this never happens. It was like, um, what's the show? The Bollywood film, uh, Slumdog Millionaire. It was like that. As if <laughs> she's made feelings. Knock yourself out. And so, yeah, and then we won. And then the trophy is still on my mum's mantelpiece, taking pride of place. <laughs> but Bobby Ball. So... Cannon and Ball, well, just, you know, may he rest in peace, obviously, but just two proper, proper old school legends of comedy came mm -hmm. up in the old working man's circuit or it's sorry, in the old working man's clubs, just have earned their stripes a hundred times over. Every time they're together, they are so on. They are just, they're in sync constantly they, they could finish each other's joke before it's even started and when we were having the briefing they were just on it on it on it and they actually love wrestling as well because twice yeah. now yeah regal knows them and twice now oh, i see because they're from blackpool aren't they yeah. exactly um and yeah twice when i've been at so one was at blackpool one was i think in hull they came and i and again, just so, so humble uh, with their families. And mm. it's quite interesting because the lads don't necessarily recognize them because I, I'd say I'm, I've got quite unique interests. And so stand-up comedy happens to be one and also old school TV happens to be one. And so, you know, even meeting someone like Michael Barrymore, I've gone, it's Michael Barrymore. Whereas <laughs> I think a lot of the guys wouldn't necessarily recognize that. And so, yeah, we had a really nice conversation actually. And they are just... Yeah, really, really special blokes. And um, yeah, you'll be sorely missed. Well, um, we grew up, in, I mean, I still live in Blackpool. John grew up in Blackpool. So we're, you know, anonymous with the Blackpool names. Gotcha. Um, but um, <laughs> it's funny, in that episode, he heckles you because you're only um, um, narving about an answer. And he says, come on, I'm, I'm on tonight. It's just, <laughs> it's just right. beautiful. That was right. So it <laughs> was... It was the question was about some comedy and they've got all these letters. I think it's all right. So you've missing letters and you Father Ted, I believe. You said Father Ted, it was Dougal. 
oh, I didn't have a clue, mate. Yeah. Like, oh, the Scooby Doo, Matt. But so the and the thing was, as long as I took on the actual what we call the RX or the TX rather, so what you see on TV, I was looking at that for about four minutes, going, I don't have a clue, and it was because I wasn't expecting to go first. So when it came to me, I remember thinking, oh, I wonder. So there are two frames of mind. You know, when you sell at home, you go, how, how does she not know that? That is easy. <laughs> Let me tell you, when you are under the cosh like that, you suddenly don't know your own name. And you <laughs> think, I actually don't know. Uh, no, I seriously don't know. What, what is my mum's name? What is my mum's name? I don't know. And as soon as I chucked out some answer, they went, no, you know, incorrect. It moves on. I went, oh my goodness, I can now see answers. I can see them. I can actually see them as I'm looking at the screen. But yeah, th those guys are just so, so fun. Ironically, they went out for, in the first round. But um, well, you, you got a high score and Bobby Ball's like, this is easy, we'll go through it. And then you knocked him out. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel bad. I feel bad now you said that. <laughs> but, uh, it, yeah, it was... Those, those kinds of shows, I have to say, are, are fun. And the bit that you don't see on TV with things like Pointless. So the way it works is you'll have a panel, well, maybe three people that are researchers that sit in the gallery behind the scenes. So, for example, you've gone, uh, n name, um, name a wrestler that has won the IC title. And so you go, okay, let's just say, for example, um, Kurt Angle. Now... There's no AI that suddenly goes, Kurt Angle in. Dug -a -dug -a -dug -a -dug -a -dug. What has to happen is they will hear that. They will then look through their list to see if he's there. And if he isn't there, they then need to Google, well, find out who Kurt Angle is to then say to, um, uh, what's the name of the, the expert on the show? Um, Thank you. Um, so they say to Richard, um, so Richard, so he said he's going Kurt Angle. Kurt Angle is actually an Olympic champion who unfortunately he won four titles, but actually he he took a hiatus from WWE the same time, whatever the line might be. So then about a minute has elapsed between you saying the word and then the column either going boo or okay. starting. So you question yourself enormously mm. having gone... Kurt Angle. Kurt Angle? Kurt Angle. <laughs> then it's locked in. At that point, you go, oh, no. And then, then your arse <laughs> off twitches a little bit, and you think, is, this, is that a stupid name? Is Kurt Angle even the real guy? Is it Kurt, is it Kurt Angle? It's Kurt Angle. <laughs> it's Kurt Angle, isn't it? It's Kurt Angle. And then finally, do -do 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 -do, and you think, yes, we're on. Mm. But it's so much fun, those shows. It's why I, in fact, I'm going on Beat the Chasers at the end of the month, which will then be okay. on. I'm not sure when it's on, but um, I, I could embarrass myself massively, but it's so much fun. I just, mm. I'm a button for punishment. Because you've done a couple of other quiz shows, haven't you? You've been on, is it Celebrity Eggheads? And then okay. uh, Mastermind as well. So Mastermind twice. I, I'll tell you the Mastermind story. So, and no one would know this either. Basically, they've gone, what's your special, what specialist subject are you going to choose? So I said, male um male olympic sprinters from 1980 to 90 to, to present day and they said it basically is too specialized you have to broaden it out so they said it either has to include disability runners or include women or include more events so i thought if i include right. disability runners there are so many categories that's going to be, that's a lot to know. And I thought I could go with female athletes as well, but my speciality comes with men's 100, men's 200, men's 400. And so they said, if you're willing to add four by 100 meter relay, four by 400 meter relay, 400 meter hurdles and 110 meter hurdles, you can go for it. Thought, okay, I'll do that one. Or so I thought, then I've turned up. Uh, and it's 11 a.m. They said, so Ratsy, your specialist subject, just to remind you, is uh, Olympic sprinters from 1980 to present day. And I said, male Olympic sprinters. <laughs> no, 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 just, just Olympic sprinters. I said, 
can we just double check? Because I presume they're only going to ask me questions about men because that, that's kind of the whole thing that they went back and forth on. And they come back to me. Um, it appears there's been a slight miscommunication. Oh, no. Uh. Oh, <laughs> no. They said, so it, it actually is women as well. I just don't believe this. On Mastermind, I can't tank on my specialist subject, <laughs> especially when I work in athletics. And so I thought, right, I've got two options. And bear in mind, you do that show for free. It's just for charity, but it's three grand for your charity. Wow. I thought, I've got two options here. I either take my pride and go. I thought, but I get no money for charity then. I thought, or for the charity I'm doing it for, it's a small charity, Blue Elephant Theatre in London. They need the money. I'm going to do it for them. That's right. Let's just, let's just do it. Let's just swallow it and off we go. And um, yeah, did it, did okay. But the, the two answers I got wrong were about female sprinters. And then Anne Widdicombe, <laughs> of all people, stuck up for me. She was, she was actually shouting at the host, <laughs> going, <laughs> unacceptable. I mean, the, the poor lad is stood here. He's doing his best. The only two questions he gets wrong are questions he has not researched. He doesn't know about it. And he's taken it on the chin. I thought, <laughs> yes, Anne. I love you, Anne Whittacombe. So, yeah, that was the mastermind story. Brilliant. How did you get on that? Did, did they sort of, like, put it out to everyone who wants to go on it? Or how does it come about? The way that kind of stuff works is, so what they'll do is, if you imagine you're casting for loosely called them celebs on these shows they'll the easy thing to do is to contact agencies so what you do is you contact an agency and just say hi my name is john i work for uh, could be mentor and the, the production company that puts on mastermind um would any of your talent consider coming on mastermind and sometimes there's a fee sometimes there isn't so in mastermind's case there is no fee but it'd be three thousand pounds for his chosen charity win or lose um and so then your agent will then email you and, or call you and say, do you fancy doing Mastermind? I mean, for a lot of them, they wouldn't bother calling them because it's just they know what kinds of things their, their clients would or wouldn't like. And so they do that to 30 agencies around the country. Um, and then sometimes it's because there might be an existing relationship with you and the person who's booking the celeb. So I might have worked with people in the past. And they thought, oh, Radzi might be quite good. Or perhaps they want somebody with an area. So let's just say beat the chasers. Let's say they're doing a sports special and let's say they've got hypothetically three women already on the show lined up as contestants. They'll want a guy. And maybe if it's three women who are 50 years old, they might want a guy, ideally a young guy. And if they've got, if it's three white women who are all around six, they might think we'd ideally like uh, somebody who represents diversity, whether that be somebody disabled, somebody from the LGBT community, somebody from, uh, ethnic minority, whatever it might be, and then they think, let's get old Radzi on. And so, <laughs> my, so it, generally, that's how that works. Just segueing into wrestling a little bit, so it's like a bit of a roundabout question, but um, you did a show um, on BBC Two about body image where you went into schools, right. and um, it's, a, it's a great show about how you, to, you, know, com you know, to be confident and body image and that kind of stuff. My question is, do you think wrestling should be, because we spoke to, do you know, Zach Knight um, of the Knight family. Okay, so we yeah. had him on and he was talking about how he's done, I mean, if you've seen Step Into The Ring, he's done so much for, you know, young people with... Totally, people just, mate. What a guy. Yeah. The show that yeah. he was, at was first class, really good. Really we had him on here and he was just, we just shut him and just let him talk because he's just, everything he yeah. says is amazing. But he was saying that, he wants to get wrestling in schools because he went to like this like bad boy school where they're all you know mis you know misbehaving and this kid um kind of responded to wrestling in a way that teachers had never seen before so i'm, I'm just wondering you know you do a lot for schools and athletics and sports do you think wrestling has a place in in schools so i would broaden it out further mate and i would say I think body movement has more of a place in our education system than it currently does. And if we're going to get a little bit political, that's partly because certain governments have sold off our sports fields. And so lots of schools don't actually have sports fields anymore. Number two, 
lots of schools don't have much money for sports facilities, it's going to be very difficult to practice wrestling in a, in a telephone booth classroom. It's going to have to be a massive investment for something like that. For, for me, it's about let's start by getting people moving. But what benefits would wrestling specifically bring? Number one, I think actually being thrown around is great in that it's actually, there's something about, so let's say chain wrestling. It's just great fun. Number two, it's teaching you gymnastics in that regard. It's teaching you body awareness. It's teaching you to overcome fears. On that iPlayer show, you saw, I mean, I'm not sure the name of that blind lad. I mean, how on- James, I believe. Right. James, yeah. What a dude he is. What an yeah. absolute dude. I mean, his bottle is off the charts. But to that, just adding that before I go back into the whole sports thing, is the crowd that were there for him, I thought, you know, you'd only see that in with wrestling fans. Because as wrestling fans, I think it, we're multi-layers in that we appreciate certain things are, let's say, landmarks. And something like that, when you have a guy who might be on a learning autistic, or sorry, a learning difficulty spectrum, somebody who might be visually impaired, somebody who might be disabled. As wrestling fans, you're then watching that going, yes, mate. So there, there is a, a pause in the suspension of reality in that I'm not watching it the same way as watching Samoa Joe and AJ Styles, but I am watching it with just total respect and awe. And now the jeopardy has changed possibly to thinking, can they make the finish? Can they hit this high spot? How clean is it going to be? How tight is it going to be? And then it's, oh, mate, just yes. So you, so you have that. Um, and I think that's o that only comes with wrestling fans because I think we're very discerning. And I think you can smell a rat as a wrestling fan. You go, that's yeah. might be a political thing. Or you go, that's, that's for other reasons. You know, let's say, um, um, or the, the Peter Rosen, Rosenberg thing with, with the 24-7 title. You know, some people might feel a certain way about it. Some people might be for it. But you, you, do, you decide what you think about that and you're very um, ardent in that decision. And I think, you know what? The support all that crowd gave for all those wrestlers, you know, whether it's somebody who lacks confidence, somebody who just thinks, just, yes, guys, that's so good. But I personally would love to see sport given a much higher priority in schools, period. Mm. I don't want to see cross-country used as a punishment. And that, that sends the wrong message. For me, mm. the facts are that, that when people do exercise, they have better concentration levels in class. And, the, and those, that's what all the evidence says. And many kids live what we call, we define as a sedentary lifestyle, where 40% of primary school kids, the only exercise they get, and this is really sad, is going from the car to the classroom and back to the car again. That is a travesty. That is such a travesty. But how do you stop that? Not by wagging your finger, but by making something inspiring and exciting and aspirational. And dare I say, if you put a wrestling ring, maybe not in a school, because that would require, I would say, specialist instruction that, that schools wouldn't necessarily be able to support. Do you set it up every single time as a lesson? Having seen how long it takes the NXT UK boys to set up a ring, it's not a fast setup. So that perhaps an area could have a ring. And in the same way as you may have um, a BMX uh, park or um, a skate park, or you might have an athletics track, why not have a center where you can learn how to become a professional wrestler? I think that, that would be awesome, especially if you tapped into guys who are already doing gymnastics, especially. Mm. I think wrestling as well can teach you about discipline because you have to be so careful when you're doing wrestling moves on someone. There's got to be a lot of trust between who you're doing it with. I think it's it'd be a good lesson for, mm. for younger people to have as well. Totally, mate. It definitely be done. And it's symbiotic, isn't it? Yeah. Because wh whether you're the person who's being essentially taking the bump or giving it, it's trust in two different ways. Um, 
and <clears throat> and also discipline in that you know if somebody's potatoing you but perhaps it's through no fault of their own mm. then having the discipline to say i understand that sometimes when you're trying to perform things go slightly awry scripts go awry in theater and that's with well it's physical theater but it's not as physical as wrestling is and so I think anything which makes young people especially move more, <clears throat> I'm all for it. I think that's that's what always amazes me is when you see like two wrestlers that you know hate each other in real life, but they they've got that trust still to, you know, do an amazing match and have the trust that the other ones got their sort of back in that. Well, I think that's part of the beauty of wrestling is that you you don't necessarily mm. know if they hate each other in real life, and you know there there are certain people. I mean, so on my started a podcast myself and the first guy I interviewed was last week and it was Mark Henry and Mark Henry, just a colossus of a human being, an absolute beast, a bear moth. Well, you know, speaking to him, it's, it's actually, I was thinking about it as we were chatting and I thought, actually, the big man is only as good as the person selling for him. Mm -hmm. and, and the little man, as it were, is only as good as the safety they're put in. If you're dropping somebody on their neck, they're not gonna take many bumps for you. And yeah, it's, it's a real dialogue that you're having between two people and also separating, I guess, you from your character, that somebody else going over on you isn't a slight on you. Actually, you can make, you can make yourself look better in a loss than you can in a win. Um, you know, w especially if it ends with a low blow or if it ends mm. with a ref not seeing something or whatever it might be, you could look like the strong guy. Um, or, you know, there are so many ways to tell that story and, and it's why I love wrestling, but you're absolutely right, mate, about the discipline. Yeah, I've always said, I think the people that are really good at selling are usually the, the best wrestlers to watch. Because if you think of like uh, Mankind and wrestlers like that, you, you remember matches they had, but they didn't necessarily always win them. But it was what they did in that match and totally sold what was happening to them. It was just unreal. Wait, did you see Ricochet's RKO recently? Yeah. Yeah. Wait, that was <laughs> so, so I'm to totally just marking out here. I mean, I watched, I, I rewound that on the network and watched that probably eight times because I didn't understand how he was still alive. Because mm. <laughs> the way he took that, I thought, hang on, but you, what? What do you mean? You were upside. He was vertical when he <laughs> RKO. It was like a jackhammer. It was unbelievable. And and again, that's you know one of the things I used to love about NXT UK is because I haven't been there. So since lockdown happened, since lockdown started, um, if you like, my roles on pause, and it's because there are no crowds. And so when the crowds are back, hopefully I'll be back. But seeing those guys being behind the curtain and watching, watching everyone else, everyone else react to their performance in the ring was my favorite thing to do. And Trent Seven was probably the leader of this. If Trent <laughs> Seven, if he loved something, everyone knew he loved something. And if he hated something, everyone knew he hated it. But you'd actually sometimes, sometimes they get an applause as they came through the curtain. And it was never fake applause. It was never, uh, um, it was never contrived. It was never just because it was the main event. It was because that match was incredible. And in a lot of cases, the only guys, in some cases, no one knows who's going over. And that, I mean, for, for my role, not necessarily great because I'm meant to, in some cases, interviewing them straight away afterwards. So it'd be nice to have a flavor of who might, you know, how it might go so I can think about the question. Um, but it's, when it's beautiful, it is absolutely incredible. And yes, and seeing that, just the admiration those guys have for what goes in the ring is, ah, oh. and even, you know, even now I got, I get excited watching the rumble. I get excited <laughs> seeing Christian come out. I get excited mm. seeing Hurricane come out. <laughs> and and that only happens it, um, 
because you know when you're i guess being brits the unique experience we have as as brits americans watch pay-per-view events or what we would have called pay-per-view events before if you like they'd watch it at eight in the evening nine mm. in the evening ten yeah not in the uk <laughs> you, you have to sacrifice you have to take a hit for the team because it's did you, did you see armageddon last night yeah i did yes what i did was i reset my vcr and <laughs> i woke up before school at 6 a.m i've watched the whole thing or i fast forwarded just to watch the main event because i know everyone's gonna be talking about it in the morning or i just stayed up and you know watching mania whether it's triple h Shawn michaels or my mate joe glendon while we were at uni i've gone to his place because he had he had sky sports that was it so his place had sky sports <laughs> So I've gone from Loughborough, which is where I was at uni. I've gone to Birmingham. It was, I think, Birmingham. I think it was Aston Uni. And we are watching Mania. He's falling asleep. And I've gone, mate, we, we, we can't miss this. We cannot miss this match. It's going to be epic. I said, I said Triple H, HBK. What I meant was Undertaker, HBK. It was <laughs> just, oh, man. I mean ah oh, flipping heck that was <laughs> i think it was about five o'clock or 5 30 it finished and we didn't want to go to bed it was mm. just this is and he had housemates and i could see they kept waking up and then guys is it possible to keep it down <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah sorry oh you know something <laughs> else happened and it was oh my goodness gracious so flipping good yeah so i have um a few quite a few brothers and in my house the rule was if you fall asleep you're allowed to be slapped. <laughs> so, and, um, so I fell asleep once and I got this almighty slap across the face. And ever since then, <laughs> you don't fall asleep and it makes you want to stay awake. And that was the rule in my house. Um, it works. Great rule. Great rule. <laughs> um, I want to go back to NXT just for a second because we interviewed Sam Gladwell, another just amazing. Great guy. Great he, guy. <laughs> he knew he was coming on the show. I did and yes, he's, he's, he's asked me to pass on a message. He said, um, ask him about the, the time the boys tried to prank him in Plymouth. <laughs> saying about, do you know what I'm on about? Yeah, I absolutely know what you're on about. I don't know this story, so please enlighten me. Okay, so what it was, so we were talking about physiques earlier on. And so they've got a photo shoot that day. And um, so Sam has been basically on strict no carbs for a number of days at this point and he is starving <laughs> and so he's i won't say why but it was, it was in a bit of a foul mood and um so we're in the changing room and um he said lads is it true they've only got cold food today and that was because on the chalkboard for whatever reason of the food description they'd They'd have two boards, chalk boards, cold and chalk board, hot, if you like. And they'd also have a, a vegan food because a lot of the guys are vegan as well. So I've immediately just gone because he's in such a foul mood. I went, and I know that he wants no carbs. He's got this photo shoot in, let's say, eight hours. I went, yeah, mate. And also he's injured at this point as well. So the only thing he's been focusing on is rehabbing and getting in the best possible nick for promo reasons. So his his physique at this point, he's really, he's on it. I went, yeah, mate, it is true, yeah. Um, so uh, I'm gutted about this, mate. They've only got sandwiches. And it, what? And he went, no, 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 no. They, they've got what? And at this point, some of the other guys who are in the room, they're all in on it. No, if I've missed part of the story, so he's gone cold food Ugh! and he's left. And at that point, I said to some of the guys, I said, if he comes back, shall I rib him and tell him that it's just sandwich? And they went, yeah, yeah, do it, do it, do it. Because he's wound up. So he's come back in and um, I went, Sam, I've, ju I've just found out, mate. I'm livid about this. You know, the only food they got was sandwiches. You know, what? No, no, they can't be just sandwiches. You know, just sandwiches. What do you mean, just sandwiches? I went, yeah, mate, I'm gutted. He went, what? I'm going to go out there and find out. I went, no, I've just done exactly the same thing, mate. I've just done it. <laughs> no! <laughs> I, this is unacceptable. I am not having 
no. And then because some of the boys are laughing now at this point, he's gone, this is not funny <laughs> because we have got to have sandwiches. I admit, I am livid about it. He went, ah! <laughs> and he just <laughs> properly goes, properly goes. Ah! What are in the sandwiches? And at this point, <laughs> I didn't get my word out. I don't know, mate. And so he goes out. Then obviously he sees it's just the normal <laughs> foods. It's in there's as there always is. There are very lean options if you want them. There are salads. There's meat on its own. There are vegan options. And he's come back and just gone. And I won't repeat it but verbatim what he's said. But he's went words perspective. Yeah, you got me there. Yeah, you, you, you got. Me. <laughs> he went. I said I'm really enjoying that because I, I walked straight into that. And he went. Basically, my reaction just allowed you to carry him, didn't it? I went, yeah. I just properly kicked off, didn't I? Yeah. He went, I can't, I can't tell you how on edge I've been all day. I've been on edge all day. Went, that just tipped me over the edge. Tipped me over the edge. And then for the next, every time I used to go back, he'd go, mate, you properly got me there. You properly. <laughs> yeah, Sam. And also what I'd say for Sam as well, he is a legit hard dude. Sam Gradwell, if I'm in a pub and it's kicking off, in Poulton La Fylde, I want <laughs> Sam Gradwell next to me because if it's kicking it off, Sam is going to be throwing some dudes out of that door. Mm. And he's in better shape than he's ever been. He's looking really good. Yeah, he is. He's. he's I think it's quite interesting because he's lost a bit of size, uh, which comes with obviously losing weight. But he just looks awesome. And I think you know he had two options. Um, option one is come back rehab and you know be the same Sam Gradwell or two is reimagine yourself and that's what he's done and, and I think he will get a push I think he'll mm. really get um I can I can foresee big things for Sam actually because he's yeah I mean his promos are like nothing else the, the way he just throws yogurt out there honestly it tickles me every time <laughs> and you know what as well it's um so he's a proper character um mm backstage a proper character one of so he doesn't care how he looks when he tell when he tells a story as in most people we have pride and it's right, I'm, i'll pretend that okay the classic scenario is so th this lad says to me in school or at uni or at work and then i said this back to him and the reality is he probably didn't say it quite as well as that back to him the reality is you look a bit silly and then you've latterly gone, I should have said this, which eventually Chinese Whispers turns into, this is what I actually said. Sam will happily bury himself in a story if it's funny. And it, he's just so cool. He's such a cool guy, Sam Gradwell. Being like a presenter, and in, you know, especially in wrestling, you get thrown in these weird scenarios. Um, and I watched one recently with Sasha Banks, and it, honestly, I had to pause it because I was laughing so hard. You're showing her British food and you show her a scotch egg, a pork pie. And it's around Christmas, I believe, because you show her some um, mince pies. And her reaction is just so funny. Well, so when, when these guys come to the UK, they'll be meeting and doing a lot of media interviews. And a lot of them are going to be very, very, very similar. And so what I said on Blue Peter was, it was going to be for online. So I said let's just do something that she's going to remember. I said, and also something that will kind of snap her out of the stupor that it's very easy to get into when it's the same question over and over. Mm. And so, you know, when I've done uh, film junkets in a hotel room with an actor or at plural, and they are doing maybe 200, 300 interviews a day, the contractual opening question will be, um, tell us about the film. So if you've got, and they will say to you, you've got six minutes with this person. And if it goes over six minutes, the cameras get cut. So you've only got, so you have to wrap it in that time. The only exception would be is if the actor is say talking for two minutes and you haven't really had a chance to say thanks for your time mm. or whatever it might be. So you have that specific amount of time and then they get the next person in. So in an hour, they could easily do anywhere from I mean they could do two interviews or they could do as they do 15 interviews and so you, 
when you ask them that question, you can see they have just glazed over. And so going ahead of that, I thought Sasha's going to be having done so many interviews. She's going to be jet lagged. She might be physically tired because they're also doing the UK tour. I think it wasn't WrestleMania Revenge. So it would have it, been, yeah, the one was, in November that they It did. was Raw in Manchester. Right. Okay. So then they're doing Glasgow as well, perhaps mm. Liverpool Echo, Hydro, et cetera. Um, and so I thought this goes one way or the other. You bring food out, and if somebody's going, this is the last thing I want to do. But because she's a consummate professional, even beforehand, I just said, I said, Sasha, I said, we've, we've got these, um, uh, this food item. Because she, when I first arrived, we got in this Tesco's bag. She, she said, oh, what's in that? And then WWE, being so professional, I don't work for them at this point, has just said, uh, can I take a look at that? I said, yeah, sure. And they said, um, in principle, we're happy for it to happen as long as everything is sealed. And, yep, no worries. So they looked at it all and it was all sealed. So she said, can I try some of that? And I said, that was what we were hoping to do. Have you she went, sure. And then <laughs> off to the races. And she was just great about it. I even said, yeah. if you want, we can do it another way around where I could try and describe to you what is in my mouth, as it were, and you can try and work out what you think it is. So I could do it blindfolded, or there are loads of ways of doing it. But because she is who she is, she was just so up for it. Yeah. And yeah, it was lovely. And you know, and you go meet these people, and you kind of just you hope you'll catch them on a good day. You hope they'll be as, as nice as you you kind of have in your head. And the amazing thing about WWE, I cannot think of a sing. I'm literally genuinely trying to think of somebody that sort of let me down. I can't think of any person, whether it's from backstage staff, production, to the actual in-ring talent. They're all just so proud to represent the company. Mm. They're all humble people. And, and maybe it just so happens that it's every person I've met. And maybe there's an element of <clears throat> if you're in NXT UK or NXT, that you're, you're you're going to still be hungry and you're you're not at the very top. But even the guys I've met at the absolute top, they're all just the opposite of the perception of footballers, I'd say. They're just such good guys. <laughs> Another good one I've seen you have an interview with was uh, Kieran's favourite wrestler, which is Cesaro. Yeah, and was that, I uh, driving the car him. with him? Yeah. <laughs> so in my Mark Henry interview that I did last week, um, uh, so that the podcast is called Making Gains, I asked Mark Henry, who are the strongest wrestlers he's ever faced in the ring. And he said, in fact, who do you reckon, boys? So he said, three people, strongest. Um, that's how I, well, I know, I know people have said about Cesaro that you and, uh, European uppercut is deadly. Um, also, <laughs> I'd probably say Bradshaw. His clothesline is horrendous. Clothesline from hell. Mate. Yeah, it looks <laughs> as bad as it probably feels. Um, so you're going Brock to APL and who's your third one, Kieran? Yeah, I'd probably say Brock Lesnar, and I think that's not necessarily his fault. He's just a, a beast, isn't he? Correct. Hence the name, yeah. And then, John? Mm -hmm. I would say Brock Lesnar, because I've seen the interviews. I know Cesaro's pretty strong. Mm. And... Okay, you're currently... Two uh, maybe, you're currently... Two uh, I want to say Goldberg, because I know he's pretty strong as well. So we actually said Big Show was the third one. Big Show. I forgot about Big Show. Um, but yeah. Yeah, Cesaro, I mean, so he's power to weight off the charts. Then we've got the fact you think, yeah, but how hard are these blokes? All oh, right, so hang on. Your teeth were knocked into <laughs> your own mm. house and you carried on. I mean, what a dude. That, that was, there were levels. It looked horrendous. You know when you see, say, say Triple H uh, in Saudi Arabia, when, when he ruptures his pack, mm. so you knew something was wrong then. You, you knew he'd hurt himself. When, again, Triple H ruptures his quad, you knew something was wrong. But I don't know what it is about specifically that Cesaro injury. I, I would go as far as to say, I think that's the worst injury I've ever seen in the ring. Yeah. And, and I think... Sorry. Sorry, go on. I was just saying, when you realise what it, he's actually done, I thought he'd knocked his teeth out. The fact that it went up 
into his gums was just horrendous. And the fact that he carried on as well, it just shows how tough he can be. And then, what were we going to do? Just pull them down back into position. Oh, okay, fine. Well, not to worry. <laughs> he, he is. So that came about because, um, so we were there for WrestleMania 2017 and we were with um, a global media contingent. And there were some guys from Dubai and they basically mentioned that one of them happened to know Cesaro and they were interviewing Cesaro tomorrow. And, um, and he said that the quite funny thing about Cesaro is Cesaro can be forgotten about when it comes to sort of big names. Um, anyway, he, he loves being interviewed. And so I thought, if there's one thing I don't like about <clears throat> TV, it's the bacon slicing. So for example, you guys reached out and you said, we'd love to interview you. And anyone who loves wrestling, I automatically like. Because I just think we've got a, just a shared love, whether it's guys from Wolverhampton, guys I've met in gyms who've come up to me and in, invariably said, I, first of all, it's, don't you normally have a, an apple in your mouth? Very good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is a niche way to start a conversation. Um, but it's immediately to think I like you already. But yeah, so you reached out and it was, love to speak to you. When's good for you? Okay, wicked. I'll let you know it worked for me. It worked for you. Bam, just like that. In TV, what a lot, a lot of the time what happens is, can we speak to you? Um, okay, yes. Can you bring this with you? Uh, okay, yes. Can you also bring this with you? Okay, yes. Can you now do it at an inconvenient time? Okay, yes. Can we now change that time? Okay, yes. And so, we, so I don't like asking, is the point I'm trying to make, to take from somebody's time. Just because this bloke has said he likes being interviewed, I don't then want to be the guy who then says, oh, can I have an interview as well? But because he sort of alluded to the fact that Cesaro almost felt as though he, he actually would enjoy the process, I said, well, I'd love to interview him if it was possible. He said, well, I can ask. He said, well, that'd be lovely. Um, I said, if there was a time tomorrow, so it was actually WrestleMania Sunday, this, this was going to be on. Um, I said, you name the time, I'll be there. I said, we'll be there. 6 a.m., 6 p.m., whatever. So he says, if it's 2 p.m., he'll do it. Or no, I think it's actually 12. He'll do it, meet him. And it was actually outside the stadium. Isn't out of the stadium at a particular gate. He'll meet you in his car. <laughs> and I thought, I mean, are you sure he's going to have it? Anyway, we went to the place. There he was in his Jeep. And he says, where would you like us to drive to, guys? And I said, um, just before we even think about this, how long have you got? As in, what, when should we cut this off? And he said, as long as I'm back by whatever it was, I'm good. And I just said, could we just go for a drive and I'll interview you in the car? And he went, amazing. So we just drove <laughs> along. I held the GoPro in my hand and we just chatted. And he was such a dude, such a flipping dude, you know. And he also just, he clearly just loves life. He loves mm. training. You know, his missus is obviously a trainer herself. Um, just such a great guy. And it, again, what was really nice was telling or conveying my passion for wrestling to the Blue Peter audience, not all of whom know about wrestling, especially not, I'd say, the girls as much as the boys. And when you suddenly go, just so you know, when I say wrestling, you probably think just men. Actually, there are women that do it as well. And these women are awesome. Take a look. And you're seeing really aspirational women who, you know, don't necessarily look like bodybuilders or people that you think, I don't want to quote unquote look like that. But they're, they're girls and women who are the kinds of people who could be pop stars. They could be track and field athletes. They could be so many people. And so lots of young girls and say, I like that. And she's amazing. And whether it's Bailey or Sasha or Charlotte or whoever it might be, and now Rhea especially, who's on this upward trajectory, that's mm. amazing. Um, yeah, it's just so, so good. And actually a number of people, specifically working on Blue Peter, said, I loved that interview. And what they really meant was, I loved him. And what they really meant was, I was surprised by him. And I think that is yeah. part of the privilege of TV, getting to shine a light on areas of passion, and knowing that people will love something if they get exposed to it. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what we wanted for this podcast. Yes, we wanted a wrestling podcast, but we didn't want just wrestlers. We wanted people who 
are just interesting. That's why we kind of gone for like um, went for Leva Lise, who is a in, she's on the independent circuit for WAW. She's an upcoming female wrestler, and we just wanted kind of normal, you know, normal, av- you know, your average Joe people who like wrestling, and like with you, you have so much apart, you know, away from wrestling. That's what we wanted to convey, and that's what I love about this, you know, journey and you know, the the podcast. Okay, lads, if I, if I were to put you guys in a spot, all-time favourite match, what are yours? Um, God, I don't, I don't, where do you start? <laughs> I think I've got two. So just because there's a storyline of it, uh, it's probably The Rock against Hulk Hogan. Ah, oh, was that? Like that? Nice. And... Just because it was, it was the first pay per view I remember watching was um, a Royal Rumble. It was on Channel Four. Correct. And it's uh, yeah, uh, it was Triple H against Cactus Jack in a street fight match. And I always remember that match, so that's one of my favourites. I but, can't say my favourite match because that's just I mean where do you start? But so my, my favourite event ever was nineteen ninety nine Royal Rumble because. The fact that Vince McMahon was getting into the storyline, and before that, he wasn't a wrestler, he was the CEO. And that whole storyline with Vince, you was like, oh my God, Vince is getting into the ring. It blew my mind. And just like, as a child, you know, that story unfolding every week, it was, it was amazing storytelling. It's the same with when Earl Hebner got in the ring, tagging with The Rock. It's, <clears throat> and JBL, I think for me, what, the role of the commentator, I think, is probably the most underrated role in all of wrestling. Because when you have JBL, sorry, excuse me, why am I saying JBL? JR. When mm. you have JR and just saying things like, No! Don't do it! Don't do it! Don't do it! it <laughs> actually just viscerally react to it. And it's seeing when Stone Cold turned heel, to me, mm. I reacted as much to, to J.R. as in, why Austin? You know, and that whole thing is, I, I, one of the lines I remember when Spike Dudley was taking on the, the, the rest of his family, it was they were going, it's tough love. You know, mm. so even that, <laughs> that then permitted me to not hate the Dudleys. He's saying it's mm. tough love, so it comes from a good place. Or even, I, I've forgotten which mania it was, when they brought JR down just to do the, the Undertaker match. And, yeah. and they brought him down, and all of a sudden, it was, ju- it was just like, it's now serious. It's, and seeing, I don't know what it is about The Undertaker, but when I've gone to say boxing fights, there's something really odd about a better example. So I was there the day when Usain Bolt lost in the 2017 World Athletics Championships, which for non-athletics fans is just like any other day. But for athletics fans, that was just, no, what, what are you talking about? That's just impossible. And so you had Justin Gatlin. It was like a wrestling event because Justin Gatlin had failed two drugs tests prior. So he was regarded as the heel. Usain Bolt, the baby face. So it went in lane one, a guy that you won't know. In lane two, a guy that you won't know. I, mean, I happen to know all of them. In lane three, from the USA, Justin Gatlin. And the boo, the actual, that noise of... It wasn't boo hiss. It was anger. It was you shouldn't be here. <laughs> and his reaction was so telling because he was devastated. And, and his parents were in that stadium. And I, I turned to my mate and said, his mum and dad have to listen to that. That's hurt him. And I said, this will either be the making or breaking of him because he was uh, I'm going to go 37, which for a sprinter is old to be world-class. And 
in lane four, someone you don't know, in lane five, someone you don't know, in lane six, Usain Bolt, oh, the euphoria, the electricity, unreal. And then it's take your marks. It's the same theater that wrestling creates at its absolute best. Because John, when you spoke about um, Rock Hogan, really what you're talking about is a feeling. Because when you say a storyline, we actually mean how do we feel? And when um, Vince gets into the ring, it's how it makes you feel. And that feeling comes from a storyline and the storyline comes from creative and ultimately taking a risk or seeing something and going with it. But that in its, in its rawest form is why I, I just, I get so excited about certain things. When I, when I hear Motorhead and it's uh, AAA, mm -hmm. hearing that happen. I mean, I, I, so I had an ACL operation in 2013. I was totally skint. I had 170 pounds in my bank account. I found out that Undertaker was gonna be there for the rest, I think it was WrestleMania Revenge Tour. And it was gonna be his last time ever in the UK. I thought, I mean, I've got to see it. How much tickets online? 140 quid. 140 quid. How much is a train ticket? 20 pounds return to Loughborough, go to London St Pancras. How much would the underground be from London St Pancras to the O2 Arena? About a tenner. Hmm. I can just do it. Let's get these tickets. I went there on crutches one week after my operation to watch <laughs> The Undertaker. And when, when the arena goes black, when it goes dark, oh man, flip, that's what, that is just, it's everything. Bloody love it. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, me and John, was, was, um, we was at Raw when it was Undertaker and Kane, they came back as brothers of destruction against the Wyatt family. And was that? man, when that, when... I the, the um, light goes and then the <gasps> fire flies. Is that 2013? Yes, it was. I think. So it was because of that that I went to the one in the O2 Arena because it was a shock that they came out as the yes, tag. That's and the one. So they'd be on the tour. So I thought, I've got to go and see it. I've got to go and see it. He's never going to be here. It was because of that. Yeah. So an interesting story about that is, so we're at Raw and we're told that like, the Undertaker's not going to be on it. Uh, it goes to an advert break and uh, <laughs> Ric Flair comes out. He wasn't on TV, he was just talking to the crowd. He was like, everybody, if you want to see The Undertaker, come to SmackDown tomorrow and you'll see The Undertaker. So obviously the whole crowd's thinking, <laughs> definitely not going to see him. <laughs> so that's when he came out, uh, that's why the crowd is like proper jumping. Yeah. It's just amazing. He knows Great what show. Doing nature boy, doesn't he? He knows exactly. Yeah. Oh, I love Ric Flair. There was a BT Sport event. I was um uh, I was asked to ring an announce for, and so I got to ring announce four people. One of them, in fact, three of them. One was Stephanie McMahon. One was um Ric Flair. One was Kurt Angle. But getting to go in front of Ric Flair, who then comes <laughs> out full music, um. Uh, what well, the, the crescendo was the nature boy Rick Fool and then you go, <laughs> I thought remember this Ramsey mate because this is flipping awesome and then when I was chatting I was chatting before I interviewed before I brought Stephanie out she basically she Stephanie'd me because she came out before I'd announced her and then she came out and basically gave me stuff on, on mic. And I thought, again, if 10-year-old Ramsey could see this, <laughs> he would be going mental. <laughs> um, what's your favourite match? Because you don't say, I don't think. Uh, it'd be uh, Taker, uh -huh. HBK, the second one. And, so, yeah. Yeah, and, mainly, and the reason being, and so I went back to that lad, Joe Glendon's, Place for, with Skybox office and it was because I just remember I, so I went to Loughborough Uni and nobody there was bothered 
And I remember I was so bothered and I could not wait for Mania. And going, getting on the train to Joe's house, getting to his house, and I remember seeing him, he was hung over. I thought, oh no, he's not bothered. And he went, mate, I don't like wrestling as much as I used to. I went, ah, oh, <laughs> are you sure you want to watch this? I went, well, that's why I've come. And he went, okay, mate, okay. And I thought, I just felt so despondent. And this was at about one in the afternoon. It gets to four in the afternoon. And he went, mate, can I be honest? Yeah. He went, I'm actually so excited now. Went, I'd forgotten how much I care about it. But you constantly talking about it has made me so excited. And then <laughs> we're just building it up and up and up. We've got a Domino's pizza and then it hits about two in the morning and then we're off to the races. And it was just that match. And I, it's the one when HBK is on that plinth and it's white and it's, mm. yeah. it's just, you know, again, the theatre. And it was, I actually could not contain myself. You know, is, is Taker going to lose the streak? Or is HBK going to, is this the end of the road? This is, what's the best option? What's, how is this? Oh man, yeah. And so again, it was that feeling I had. That feeling was just, yeah. And equally, and not a match per se, but every single time the rock went, finally, the rock mm. has come. <laughs> oh man, what a guy. Let's, Who's your um, favourite growing up? Sorry, John. Favourite, so if you came to my room at uni, I was very successful with the ladies, uh, as you'll know, <laughs> because I had 17 posters of none other than Dwayne The Rock Johnson. <laughs> Good show. Now, you've got um, a brand new podcast, and you said before that you've done one episode, and your first episode is with The Mark Henry. Yes. What a way to start your, your podcast. Um, just tell me about your podcast and... Is there a chance you're going, you're going to get The Rock on? Oh, I mean, I don't is think... That, is that a possibility? I mean, <laughs> if you play the lottery enough times, there is a chance that you're going to win. Um, <laughs> I think it's very unlikely that I, I get The Rock. I mean, I, The Rock is... For me, what it's about is sharing my passions with uh, the viewer, the listener. And so Making Games is about the idea that it's about people that are, as the sign says, on the pursuit of excellence. So whether that be and so a focus, a skew to strength, speed and power, but people who are dedicated to that pursuit. So it could be a chess player, a snooker player, an astronaut, an astronomer. It could be anyone, but with a focus to strength. So strong men, bodybuilders, powerlifters and wrestlers, track and field athletes. Um, so it's... Um, uh, the kinds of people I wanted to start with Mark because I, I kind of had a contact with Mark and I just thought, you know, he's a three times world champion in three different sports, in three different strength sports. He still has, so in powerlifting, um, there are three movements, squat, bench and deadlift. And the way you, so if we're all competing in powerlifting, it's about our total. So each lift, you have three attempts. You choose the weight you go for. So if I hypothetically get 100, 100, 100, my total will be 300. And let's say, Kieran, you go 100, let's say you went um, 200, 200, and two. Even though you only got two kilos in one lift, it's all about your total. So it's nuanced, but so there's a world record for the biggest total of all time in powerlifting. There's also a total for the biggest total, which includes two other movements, clean and jerk, and then snatch, which are Olympic lifting movements. So that's five lifts. The world record for the five lift total is still held from 2002, Mark Henry. And I can assure you, there are a lot of strong men who are a lot stronger than all the strong men from 2002. And that man, he's the largest ever Olympian. He can dunk a basketball with 360 pounds. He qualified for the 1992 Olympics weightlifting team off the back of nine months training in Olympic lifting. He is an absolute species of a bloke and so 
lovely with it. Um, and so, yeah, so for me, Mark was just the perfect way to begin. Um, I've, I actually, funnily enough, just after this podcast, I'll be uploading my interview with Big E, um, nice. is, my, is my next one. Um, and then as far as wrestling goes, um, so I've got a guy called Rob Kearney, who's uh, the first ever openly gay uh, elite strongman. Uh, I've got a guy called Martin Ty, who's the world's strongest disabled strongman. Uh, I've got Adam Jumilly, one of the world's fastest men. Um, hopefully have a couple of Olympic athletes in there uh, in different sports as well. Um, and then, um, uh, and a few that I'm sort of keeping my fingers crossed for. So for me, it's about sharing that passion and, and, and yeah, and I think also, you know, part of the reason I came onto your podcast, and I appreciate you talking about mine, is I think that's kind of what life's about. It's about, you know, are, are things always massively convenient? No. Is, could I be doing other things? Yes. But actually, if we love, if we have a shared love, then why not give to that? Why not mm. invest in that? And so, you know, whether it's turnbuckle podcast, gorilla position, whatever it is, I think actually I love that you're doing it and it's based purely on passion and you don't have to do this. This is, you know, it takes bottle to do what you're doing. It takes bottle to reach out to people. It takes bottle to be judged and possibly have other people go, they don't know what they're talking about. You know, <laughs> they're, you know, they're marks or they're getting paid by WWE or, you know, I said Nick Aldis and he didn't even know the TNA guy. You know, that's <laughs> part of the yeah. uh, kind of community that we're in. But yeah, I think it's, I think it's awesome. And so hopefully my podcast will just go from strength to strength and I'll keep interviewing people. Well, um, me and John, we're going to, we're going to put all your social media and, and your podcast details um, in our description and, you know, Thanks. yeah. Yeah, really appreciate that. Do you have any final words, John, before we wrap it up? Uh, I mean, we've talked about a lot. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't, did we ask, how did you get a job at WWE NXT? Yeah, good question. So the way that happened was, <clears throat> um, so Blue, um, we did a couple of films with WWE. So one was with The New Day was the first one, and that was at the Manchester um, arena um, and that was actually we got to be go inside the ring which is something that media never get to do um, and part of that was they knew from the conversations that we'd had that there was nothing but respect there it wasn't going to be one of these and so is it real you know that lazy stuff that goes on mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that was incredibly cool we then did a film Sasha Banks um, we then uh, spoke to them about going to Wrestlemania uh, which was just off the charts. And then we also um, release, um, announced and showed to the world the brand new, uh, what was then, no, in fact, it still is, what, sorry, what was then called the WWE United Kingdom title. And that then went out to the, the world, if you like. And so Blue Peter and NXT UK sort of go way, way back to that, really. And when Michael Cole was the guy who came to Blue Peter to talk about it, and it and along with Nigel McGuinness, who, by the way, still wears the Blue Peter badge on air. <laughs> such a such a cool guy for that. Such a cool guy. And um, and so I reached out to Michael and just said, "Look, I love wrestling. I love WWE. If there's ever anything that happens in the UK, I'd love to be considered." And he said, uh, "Let's stay in touch." And then six months later, he got in touch to say, "You reached out before. Would you still be interested?" And I said. Yes, I would be. And he then gives me a call and says, I'm just going to cut to the chase. Um, we have this brand new product starting imminently. We want you to be the backstage reporter. Do you want to do it? It's as, as quick as that. And I said, yes. And so <laughs> that was it. And I, I, I went to go and watch. Well, first of all, I was at the, the first um, UK tournament in Blackpool. I watched when Tyler Bate one and I remember he was on the front row I believe second sorry he was on the front row yeah I, I was very I was very lucky yeah. it, was, it was it was just awesome to see it and actually what happened was uh, I occasionally remind Tyler of this and only because um I it, I just imagine what my mum would have been thinking so he's just one confetti's going off and I turned around and there was a couple sort of late um to a man and woman and they were about let, let's say 50s and I turned and 
I could see they wanted past. And it was a bit of a melee right by ringside. And so I thought, right, why are they? I thought, that's his parents. <laughs> and so, and the mum is kind of in this, I don't think she knew he was going to win, is my guess. I'm guessing the dad did. I'm guessing the dad had an idea, and I'm guessing the mum had no idea. It would be my guess. But you could see his mum was just, it was so overwhelming. And she's got a camera or a phone, and she's holding it. And I thought, nah, you can't be taking a photo from back here. And so again, speaking to wrestling fans, I just went, guys, Tyler Bay's mum and dad are here. Let them go to the front. And everyone just parted. And bear in mind, wow. what I wanted to do was get their picture and, be, and have their moment looking at him and sharing, you know, a gaze and whatever. And everyone just let them go to the front. And I thought, just yes, guys, that's what this is all about. Because who does he want to see most in the crowd? His mum and dad. Because he was stood on the, he was stood on the turnbuckle um, with his title. And it, they, got, they got to have that moment. And I just remember thinking, excellent. I'm so pleased I was here, if nothing else, just for that. Mm. Uh, it, was, it was just lovely. And again, the only reason I'm sort of mentioning that is I just think it just speaks to... Imagine trying to do that at a football match. We wouldn't have a chance yes. hell of getting, mm. getting parents... Could they go, we don't know that. If, it, if we recognise the... If it's, I don't know, um, who's the manager of... Um, uh, how, if it's Harry Redknapp, then you go, yeah, let, let Harry forward. It's Harry Redknapp. But apart from that, it's not going to happen. Um, but so, you know, I've, I was there at the very start. And so it's just like, it's just been a privilege to watch it grow and watch Tony Storm go from strength to strength. Rhea Ripley go from strength to strength. The Grizzled Young Vets go from strength to strength. Pete Dunn. I mean, not even go from strength to strength. He's just really strong now. And it's just, it's so cool to see the guys everyone's got their own story you know the grizzled young vets have been doing this for such a long time now unbelievable stories about japan and europe just really humble lads working class lads from liverpool Rhea ripley from australia no one in australia was really doing it she comes over to the u.s takes the chance just making stuff happen works her ass off in the gym looks like a beast strong as an ox tony storm same story with her works on her character i think i did her very first interview on nxt uk you know went from a relatively relatively uh, nervous person on camera to now just owning it you know just it's so cool and now i think who's next to quote goldberg you know who is going to be the person who's going to grab the the mantle as it were and just hit it hard you know could it be sam gradwell could it be um uh jordan devlin tyler i mean he's destined for great things undoubtedly um you know could it be dave mastiff you know could it be Ginny? could it be um isla dawn you know it's so many it's exciting the storylines yeah. with um uh, especially the Welsh contingent and how they've kind of mixed their background. It's just brilliant. I, I hope what I've kind of conveyed over the last couple of hours or whatever is that <laughs> it's just a kind of a, it, it's not just a gig. I do love wrestling and I love wrestling fans. And I love being able to be a part of a wrestling community. Well, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Like I said, I'm a huge fan of, of, of your work and uh, I was very happy when you accepted to come on yeah, same here well, and also i just have to say you know i i do do some interviews from time to time and not many of them are nearly as well researched as you guys are so i massively appreciate your research mm -hmm. very few people would make the connection between simon thomas inspiring it happening very few people would know about spike the lion very few people would know about the. i mean actually watching the footage very i mean it's it's, it's really nice uh, talking to you. And I really appreciate the time you've taken, obviously, ahead of this. So it's been a, a real pleasure, lads.